Thanks, Jacqueline and Grayson. Well, welcome, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, I don't know what your week's been like in this last week. Uh, I had a head cold. I uh, remind you that there are other things out there besides COVID uh, that are going on. Uh, and I had this head cold that just kind of stopped up my head on one side. Uh, and still today, I feel like I'm talking a little bit in a, in a barrel uh, today a little bit. Uh, but I'm glad that you're here today, and I'm glad that we're here to gather uh, to worship the Lord, be reminded of who we are, who He is, and what really matters uh, today in the midst of everything that's going on. Uh, we're in the middle of a series in 2 Timothy, and I want to direct your attention to the end of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, uh, right at the end of that section, and we're going to begin uh, in verse 10 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to make you aware of the idea that you've got a, a bulletin here, and you'll find right if you flip it over here on the back, uh, you'll find a basic outline, and I, I want to bring that to your attention. Uh, I know for myself uh, that when I write something down, it sticks with me longer. Um, and so I want to encourage you to write something down. I don't know what God's going to say to you this morning, but if you're open to what He wants to teach you today, He will tell you something today. Something will stick out to you, and you need to write it down. And also, I want to encourage you, one of the ways that you, you get something to stick in you is you write it down, then you go later on and you reflect on it, maybe return to the passage and think about it a little longer. You consider, well, okay, if this is true, then how would this affect the way I think, the way I behave, the way I relate to my family, how I think about my job, right? And also to talk about it with somebody else, right? God always gives us something that he's trying to teach us so that we can be a conduit through which he can bring it to someone else. Every time I learn something, uh, it's, it's amazing how, and, and I say this almost consistently, when I learn something, I get excited about something, it seems like God has a conversation for, for me in the next couple of days where it's like, okay, Greg, I gave you this for this moment. And so I want to encourage you to, to, to prepare for that and anticipate that, uh, that God wants to teach us, and uh, I want, want you to be ready uh, for it today as we do that. Now, our series title, we've talked about this series in 2 Timothy is Unstoppable, uh, and we're talking about this because it's really a very, very dark background to this little book. Uh, Timothy uh, is Paul's protege in the ministry. They've traveled together now for years. Timothy had come to Christ. You can read about the story, a little bit of the backstory back in Acts chapter 16, uh, that Paul had been ministering in his first missionary journey in the area where Timothy had grown up. But Timothy was already a believer uh, before he met Paul. And Timothy came from a mixed family. Uh, his dad was a Gentile. His mom was a Jew, uh, which speaks of some very interesting things, meaning that at one time in uh, her life, uh, her mo his mom was an outcast from her Jewish background because she had Hellenized or acculturated in Hellenism in a way that would have made her an outcast from her own Judaism and had married a Gentile. And so she comes to Christ. We don't know the backstory. We get her name at the beginning of 2 Timothy. And she came to Christ. Uh, and Timothy had been taught as a young man uh, about the gospel, about the truth, about who Jesus is and what he had done. Uh, and had already believed. And so when Paul comes in, he had already heard about Timothy's reputation. Uh, and he asked Timothy to start to accompany him on his ministry. And so he becomes a part of his entourage. Well, now we're at the end of Paul's life. And we're at the, the last book that Paul is going to write because right after uh, this book, he's going to be uh, convicted of being a traitor over against Rome. He's going to be taken outside the walls of Rome and he's going to be beheaded. And so here's Paul writing from a very dark moment in his life, writing to encourage Timothy, who on the other hand is not only facing the loss of his father in the faith, the person who's truly been uh, the person who's discipled him and brought him into the riches of Jesus, but he himself is facing a very, very difficult situation in the church at Ephesus, which is one of the most significant mission outposts of this early church. Paul had spent over three years there establishing various churches, and now there is a group of false teachers who are taking people away from the truth. Matter of fact, Paul says in chapter one, all of Asia has left me. Right? So it's, it's not that every person has left, but it's a mass defection from the truth. And so here's Timothy in a very difficult assignment of his own, right, dealing with leadership that has gone awry, and he's one of the faithful who's trying to hold on to the truth in the midst of stiff opposition. At the same time, Paul is facing the end of his life, and so Paul writes into Timothy's life to encourage him, right? 
bearing witness at the one hand to the sufficiency of God's grace to sustain him in the darkest moment and also to sustain Timothy in the darkest moment, right? So we're coming now to the passage, which is the final charge that he's going to give to Timothy. And it's a two-part charge. It's the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. So I'm going to take the end of chapter 3 today, and then Pastor Steve will take the beginning of chapter 4 uh, next week. And then Paul's going to wind up with a whole set of instructions, personal instructions, about who he would like to come see him before he dies, about people who've gone different places and so forth and so on. And we're going to see that Paul, even as he winds up his charge with Timothy, he loves and worships right up until the end. He loves and worships right up until the end. He is completely uh, focused on furthering God's mission. He's not absorbed in his own sadness. So key thing, the unstoppable life is what we're looking at here. So as we've looked at it here, we are asking God to deepen our faith in Christ, to strengthen our resolve, to follow him, to guide us onto and in the path of of truth and life, and to keep our steps from faltering along the way. Now when we think about uh, Paul and Timothy, it's this big situation that's here, but here in, in mind, every day we have a decision to follow Jesus or not. Every day the decision to follow Jesus occurs in the mundane things of life how we spend our money, what we watch when we entertain ourselves, how we spend our time, how we talk to the people in our lives, what the priorities are that are driving our lives, how we respond to difficult moments. Every day we're choosing whether or not we're going to hold on to the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done, or we're going to buy into some other description of what really should run our lives. Right, so every day. So it's not just the big things. For most of it, it's not the big thing that we're facing right now. It's the everyday challenge to be faithful to God at a job that is boring. It's the everyday challenge to be faithful to God when your marriage is difficult. It's the everyday challenge to be faithful to God when your kids are not listening to anything that you're saying to them. Right? Or the everyday challenge to be faithful to God when your husband or wife are are kind of drifting in a way that you're worried about what's going on in their soul. And you don't feel like you can get there to them. Well, what does it mean for you to be faithful in this moment when they're not responding to you or giving to you what they should be as a spouse? And so you're having to kind of carry the relationship on your own. Or being faithful to God when you've served God over life and you're praying and you're agonizing for kids who've walked away from the Lord. Right? Those are the kind of things, are we going to be unstoppable to keep moving after the Lord, even in the face of adversity? So this is Paul, right, that uh, the goal by God's grace is for us to wind up in life and be able to say, by God's grace, what Paul says, I have fought the good fight. Notice all these, these things that are done now. Paul sees himself at the end of his life. I've fought the good fight. I've, I have fought for the rule of Christ in my heart day in and day out. I have finished the race, the course that God has given me in my life, which for Paul was to be a pioneering missionary to the people who did not know Christ. He's finished that course. I finished that course. I have kept the faith. I haven't turned my back on the Christ who saved me by his grace. And so now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. As we sing, right, I believe in the resurrection, right? The resurrection not only demonstrates that Jesus is fully God because he conquered death and came out of the grave, but it also is his promise that he will come and bring us into his resurrection, right? kept the faith, all those things. So when I say I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I believe everything that the resurrection says about Jesus, that he is Lord, but I also believe in everything that Jesus taught about the resurrection, that his was the first fruits, the first of a harvest of which I'm going to be the rest, right? So I live in between his resurrection and the future resurrection that he's going to bring, and that's the hope and the promise that that girds up my life in the present. Right? I was with my mother yesterday, uh, and we went down to visit her, uh, and it was just a, a crazy uh, set of events that came about. Uh, we drove down, and as soon as we got there, my mom said her cat was sick. And um, her cat is just a good companion to her, and she enjoys taking care of it. And we saw the cat. We saw the cat was really sick. make a long story short, we 
flurried around to try to get to a vet to do a whole bunch of things, couldn't accomplish that, and, and the little cat died yesterday. And um, one of the things about that moment uh, is that my mom is in a stage of life where she has experienced death upon death. And she was just recounting a large family that she comes from. She was recounting all of her brothers and sisters who have died. And now among the older ones, she's the only uh, uh, older sister that's left, only one other sister beside herself. Uh, but one of the things that happens in, in life, even in those little moments which we know, right, the cat's not the same thing as a brother or sister, at least I hope you know that, right? The cat's not the same thing as a brother and sister and all those things. But it's just like death upon death. And life reminds you, right, over and over again that things don't last. That things, right, are out of our control in a way that we can't. And apart from the resurrection, you would have to be mad just to deny the reality that life is fragile and brief. And only with the undergirding of the promise of Jesus Christ can you face today with a confidence knowing that the thing that truly threatens you, the real threat in your life, is not a threat anymore. And so not only can you live with joy and anticipation, but you can take risks that other people would not take because your hope is not in protecting your life. Your hope is in the Christ who has secured your life. Right? So the idea here, the unstoppable life, is to live across life through the deaths that we will experience through our life. Right? Now today our topic is to stand firm. And uh, I want to come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to work our way through the passage here. Uh, but I want to take off on a, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, slavishly uh, utilizing a title I heard from Al Mohler at one time. Uh, and it just recurred, uh, came to my memory as I was thinking through this passage. And most of us are familiar with uh, this phrase, especially many of the husbands here, and probably justly so, right? Uh, don't just stand there, do something. Right? So you probably had somebody say that to you. Don't just stand there. Do something. Right? Stop standing there. Right? The kids are tearing up the house or somebody's running out somewhere. Right? Don't just do that. Now, uh, in this passage we're going to look at, Paul reverses that statement and just kind of stands it on his head. He just puts it the way around. He says, don't just do something. Stand somewhere first. Right? Don't just do something, stand somewhere first. In other words, before he finishes up this final charge to Timothy, the final charge is in 4, 1 to 8, and that charge is preach the word. Preach it, Timothy, in season, out of season. Do it in the face of people who are going to reject it. Timothy, keep after it, keep after it, Timothy. That's what you have to do. But in this passage, Paul says you need to decide on what's true first. Before you act, you need to put your foundations down first. Because when you get into the fray, when you get into the emotional uh, uh, density of people's difficulties, when you get into the fact that you're unpopular and people are standing over against that, when you find the opposition, if you don't uh, set your foundations first, then you're going to be swept off your foundations. So the first passage here that we're looking at here is, Timothy, before you, you preach the word, you better be decided and clear and convinced about what word you should be preaching, right? That's the key thing, right? So there's people that are preaching all kinds of words today. So as we live our daily lives, and especially when we're faced with some of the big decisions in life, right? Think of some of the decisions, career decisions, marriage decisions, financial decisions. A lot of crazy, a lot of people are making decisions about buying and selling houses in this moment, right? The decisions that you're making that are big decisions. When we make decisions, what we believe to be true will shape our decisions, right? Big and small decisions. Every day we're living out what we believe that we think will be in our best interest and what will be in the best interest of the people we care about. In other words, where we've chosen to stand, the things that we believe are determining our choices, right? And how we're living. So this suggests we need to think carefully about what life is about, right? And this is not something that people are, are encouraging you to think about holistically about what life is about. They just want you to think about the cause that's in front of you any given moment. Right? So every day, if you're engaged in the larger political discussion in, in, in the United States, the, the news media and different people are trying to set the agenda for the important topics by what they report on. So even if they're not biased in the issues that they cover or how they cover them, 
right? They're biased in the sense of that they're saying that's an important issue, that's an important issue, and that's one, and we all need to talk about it. And so the idea here is we need to th think carefully about life is really in the midst of all of these. And we've, we've talked about this as we've gone through the COVID thing, right? One of the things that came out of COVID was is that the motto, safety first, became a part of the COVID world. Safety first. And everybody, safety first, safety first. Well, as a follower of Christ, as we think about that deeply, as a Christian, safety isn't first. Faithfulness is first. Right? Faithfulness is Christ is first. If, if safety was first, we would have no missionaries. If safety was first, you would never talk to an unbeliever. If safety was first, you would never confront another Christian about their sin. Right? If safety was first, we could not follow Jesus. Thank God that Jesus didn't say safety first. Right? No, I don't like the cross. Safety first. So that kind of idea here, we've, we've challenged some of those underlying ideas that get thrown out in the middle of the moment. So we need to reflect on what truths are shaping our lives and whether or not we should build, be building our lives on them. Are they really a good foundation that will create a stable, flourishing life, right? Or are they truths that I hold nothing more than shifting sands of popular opinion, right? What am I holding on to? Will the truths I hold carry me through the valleys and mountains of life? And especially through the valley of death. Right? What's going to prepare me to live a satisfying life today and a life to come? Now, perennially, there are two options. They're being commended in the United States all the time. They're being commended in different forms. There's either one that you are, the story is that you're just raw material and you get to make up yourself however you think you should. Right? And that, that you're a, a, a person that gets to create your own existence, and life is something that you discover, right? As a matter of fact, it's even getting more fundamental in the sense that you discover it in such a fundamental way that there are certain people who would discourage anyone from even labeling your gender identity once you're born, right? Because you need to discover what gender you are, so it's really uh, illegitimate for somebody to look at the sonogram and say, oh, look, it's a little girl. Well, you're assigning that to them. We're just going to have to see who they are as they grow up, all right? So the whole idea is that you're raw material and you get to figure it out and technology gets to help you create yourself in a particular way, but that's a major story that's being foisted on us all the time. And it's affecting you if you're a parent, right? It's affecting you if you're a parent, right? Just in this last week, right, to children's networks, came out with just two uh, uh, videos encouraging children to think about all kinds of sexuality issues in very distorted ways and very uh, attractive child-oriented perspectives from Nickelodeon and from Blue's Clues and different things along those lines. And they're trying to get your kids to think about their identity from the beginning in a particular way. Some of the things that have happened over this past week, they fired a teacher who had introduced a video uh, on sexuality into first grade class and they finally discovered it, the parents, and they decided that they didn't want their first graders learning about self-pleasuring and so they fired her. Thank God for that, right, happened. But those are the kinds of things that there's a vision of life and we need to undo that there is no sacred order of things. You weren't created in a particular way. We need to free people from these boundaries that culture has put on them to be their authentic self. Well, then there's the other vision, right, that you've been created and you have certain limitations and certain potential. As a matter of fact, if, if I love you or care about you, I'm trying to help you understand what your limitations are and what your potential is, right? And matter of fact, the other vision is that without the creator's intervention and guidance, I can't truly live life. So those are two big, big visions of life, right? Now, this comes down to relationships, right? It affects us in how we love each other. Because if we're loving each other, we want to love each other toward their best. Right? I want to love someone. Well, we have to define, well, what is it to be best? Well, in, the, in that one vision of life, all I am to do if I really love you is whatever you think you are, I'm to validate it and to affirm it. Saying, great. I think that's great. I want you to be your authentic self. And that's my job. And that's why and, and, and as Christians who are living with a vision of how God has made us and wants to redeem us to become, we're trying to encourage one another toward what Christ wants us to be. And that vision in Scripture is till Christ is formed in us, Galatians chapter 4, 
that we love what he loves, we hate what he hates. We begin to relate to God in the way that Christ did, fully submitted to him. We see ourselves as, as servants of God, fulfilling God's will, loving one another toward Christ as Christ. Well, that's where he's trying to take us. And if I love you, if I love John, if I love Larry, right, if I love Jake, and I see them walking away from Jesus, I'm on my knees praying, God, please don't let them go down that path. But if my only job is to figure out, right, what they think they are, and then just to affirm what that is, then if I'm someone who says, you know, hey, I don't think you should be heading down that path, well, then I'm someone who's trying to keep them from being their authentic self. I'm actually oppressing them and hurting them. So these visions here is calm, right? We need to figure out what's true, and there's these foundations we need to stand on, and we need to keep re-articulating them. We need to keep telling them to our children. We need to keep telling them to each other. We need to keep telling them, right, to the people of Christ, and we need to keep living them out in the places where God puts us, right? So many different things here. So when Paul comes to this challenge, he wants to give a picture of what it means to stand firm, right? Uh, of what it means to stand firm on something. And he's going to do kind of three moves. You can see it here. He's going to give himself as a picture of standing firm. He's going to, right in the middle, talk about an accepted truth that we have to embrace if you're going to stand firm. It just goes with the territory. And then he's going to wind up by saying, well, what is it that you need to stand on? Okay? And in the midst of that, we'll talk about what standing means in Paul, because standing for Paul is not a, not a, you know, a passive activity or just you know, immo immobility, right? Like I'm here and I'm immobile. No, for Paul, it's an active posture of holding on to a given position and living it out in life, and it's withstanding pressure to move away from it, right? So it's an active posture that he's after. Right, so let's talk about this first one, what standing firm looks like, and let's read our first two verses in, in 2 Timothy 3. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, the persecution, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Now, Paul is going to call Timothy to take his stand on God's word. I want to talk about that in a moment. He calls Timothy to reflect on his life as an apostle. Timothy had seen Paul's life up close through thick and thin. Right? If you think about what this assumes, this, this call that he's making to Timothy, Timothy, you know, Timothy, you have paid attention to all of these facets of my life. There are very few people in your life who would know you this intimately. Okay? Any of you that are parents, right, and, and you, all of us who are children and have had parents, we know that this is the kind of intimacy that you have within a family. Right? Your, your kids watch you. Right? Our parents know that, right? This is one of our, our jokes and fears, right? Please emulate the good things about me and not the bad things, right? But they watch us. They listen to us talk about Jesus, and then they watch us live out our lives. And they try to see if they meet together. They try to see if it looks like that. They hear us mouth the scripture and talk about it, and then they see the way that I talk to Rana, or Rana talks to me, or the way we treat each other. All those kinds of things, people, this, for somebody to know you this intimately means they have to be exposed to you over time through every kind of situation in life, right? Because you can't know this from getting, meeting somebody once a week at a discipleship meeting where you both get showered and talk about Jesus, but you never actually see each other live out your lives, right? So there's a real intimacy here. So he had come with Paul as the furtherance of his own commitment and Paul now calls his attention to the elements that characterize and drove their service together, right? So he's appealing to Timothy and the experience that he had. So here he's going to give a portrait of what it means to stand firm. And here I just broke out the various things that he says. Now, the way it's worded, you can't put it this way in English because it seems redundant, but the way Paul words it is that my should go with every one of the things that he speaks there. My teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my love, my patience, my uh, endurance, my persecution and sufferings. So that belongs with every one of them. So he's, he's saying, Timothy, look at my life. Okay? Now, Paul never, never, right? 
He knows because Paul is a man who has struggled with sin. If you want to read about Paul's struggle with sin, you can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Right, 2 Corinthians 12 says that he struggled with arrogance because of the many things that God gave him. And so God gave him a thorn to restrain his arrogance. Right? So Paul, it wasn't that he's calling Timothy to look at him and say, Timothy, you won't find anything in my life, any sin, any struggle. No, you'll find a man who's handled and struggled with sin, but who's turned to Christ to find resources for them. Right? And the overall trajectory of my life is these things. And so he breaks it out. And so I just want to comment on each one of them a little bit, and let's walk our way through them. So the first one here is my teaching. And I think he begins uh, his list in a way to talk about what's foundational, and then he goes from my teaching to my way of life. And so the teaching is the foundation, it's the truth that shapes his life, and then he wants to go and break out the various aspects of that kind of life that the teaching of Christ has shaped, right? Now, come back to chapter 1 with me for a moment, and remember, when he gave his opening charge to Timothy, he recounted the gospel, a kind of a short outline of the gospel, and that's what he wanted Timothy to keep that truth and not let that go. So, here it is in, in uh, verse 8 of chapter 1. Oops, Second, First Timothy doesn't read the same. Uh, all right, um, Rather, right here in the middle, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but, gr but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, um, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. And this is why I'm suffering. And so he ends in verse 13. What you've heard from me, Timothy, keep as the pattern of sound teaching. Right? This overarching story, right, that before time, God the Father made a plan in Christ by the Spirit to reclaim and restore everything, that big story, Timothy, you need to hold on to at all cost. And, and it means then that, that God interceded in fallen, broken people, not because of anything that you did. God rescued you when you, were un, when you deserved judgment. He came after you and rescued you. Well, how did he do that? He did it in Jesus Christ. Jesus came and what? He nullified death. He took into himself the curse of the law that you deserve for your sin. He exhausted that on himself, and he freed you from the consequences of your sin, death, and then he brought you to life. And so he's made you a new creation. He's going to resurrect you in the future, right? Timothy, that's the pattern you got to hold on to today. That's the story that you live into, and the Spirit of God has been given to you to sustain you to hold on to that. That's the pattern, right? That's my teaching. And then he says, my way of life then issued from that. So the way of life then, it's not just a philosophy. It's not just uh, thoughts up here that we love to get together and talk about as Christians, right? We get a Bible study out and we pull our Bibles out and we write down some things and so forth and so on. Then we put it back on the shelf and then we go live our lives as if we didn't even read it, right? No, it's something that, that affects the way I think about myself, the way I think about my neighbor. It makes me confess sin, to recognize sin. It lets me draw on the power of Jesus, right? It's something I rehearse to myself over and over again. Uh, I, I told you that uh, Ron and I, uh, most of the time when we're faithful and we get up in the morning, we, 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 we exercise together and we walk and pray together. Always by discipline, uh, because I need to be reminded Almost always I begin my prayer, Lord, today I want to thank you for Jesus. I want to thank you for everything that I have in Christ today. Lord, because what you have done, I have everything that I need today to follow you today. And God, you have taken everything that truly threatens me out of my life. God, you have given me everything that I need today. Lord, please, by your grace, let me live into the truth of your rule and reign today. Every day. The teaching of the scriptures that undergirds my life. The, what doesn't undergird my life is whatever is on the media today or however somebody may be treating me today. What's true is that Christ is ruling and reigning. He saved a wretch like me and he made me new. And he's given me life and he's empowered me today and he's going to bring me home. That's what's true. 
That's who I am. That's what I'm about. So Timothy, my teaching, and then my way of life that leaves from that. And then he begins to break it down. It's a life of trust, right? My faith. Initially, it began with a trust in the gospel, that, that message. I am lost. I can't help myself. God did something for me in Jesus. I believe that, right? That's how it started. But that's how it's sustained every day too. Today, I believe that he did that and he's still saving me. He saved me, he is saving me, and he will save me, right? So I trust that today. He's at work today even if my husband is an idiot today. He's at work today even if, if I'm struggling to see my identity as Christ has made me. He's at work today even if it seems like America has lost its mind. He is at work today even if I'm still struggling with that same old sin because I know that even though he's made me new, I've not been freed from sin's impact completely. I know that today. So I'm not naive, I'm not overwhelmed by that, but I'm on guard. I'm aware that he's trying to destroy me. I, we prayed today as we, as we drove in, the evil one is busy this morning trying to distract you from the things that God wants you to hear, and he's busy trying to divide us over against each other. Because that's what he does, because that's exactly the opposite of what the Spirit of God wants you to do. He wants you to be just laser focused on God, and he wants you to be unified with each other. That's what he does. So it's a life of trust. And so I'm trusting him that I need this group of people. Right? Donna came in today, and Donna, so good to see you today. Donna is with us. And she came in today, and I said, Well, Donna, we're so glad you're back. It's the same old cruddy people. We need you to help us. Right? It's the same old cruddy people with all of our brokenness and everything else. We need you to be here, to be our sister, to love us. And we need to love her. Right? And why am I doing that? I trust Jesus. I trust Jesus. That's why. It's a life of trust. It's a life of patience. Well, patience is something that assumes hardship. It's a life where you confront hardship with patience. You face provocation, annoyance, misfortune, delays, hardship, pain, right? With strength and calm and without complaint, right? I know we've all done this this last week. We've, we've faced all those situations and none of us have complained. So that, you know, I know that's a waste of time to even tell you about that, right? That's one of our difficulties, right? To, with patience, knowing that things really aren't out of control, right? That I really don't need my way. What, what, what I need is Christ's way. Patience, it's a life of love, right? where I'm willing, because I have been loved, to stend my life so that other people might have God's best, at, even if it's at my cost. It's a life of love. And that's Paul's. He gave of himself. Sometime you need to read, right in the backdrop of this, Paul's ending his life as a martyr, but you just should read his normal life. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and read the basic things that were a part of his everyday experience. Most of the things that you and I have an experience, right? Like stoning and beating, being deprived of food and shelter, right? And I mentioned this to you before, if we had Paul in front of us today, right? One of our forebears in the faith, we probably couldn't stand to look at him if we stripped him to the waist, he would be so scarred. A life of love, a life of endurance, right? Of persevering at the same thing over and over again. How many of you get tired of doing the same thing over and over again? What do you need every day? You need to go to God's word and let him tell you who you are and who he is and be reminded of that. And do you need it today? Yes. Do you need it tomorrow? Yes. Do you need it Tuesday? Yes. Do you need it Wednesday? Yes. Will you need it until Christ takes you home? Yes. Will you get tired of it? Yes. Right? This is why I know I've mentioned this to you before too, but G.K. Chesterton talks about one of the effects of heaven is that maybe because of the fall we get we get tired of good things. We get tired of good things because of the fall and we want something new. And so G.K. Chesterton says that maybe when we get to heaven, we'll all be like little children. You know, when you do something with a little child, you do it once and then they say again. And then you do it again and then again and again, right? And the adult has to distract them because the, the, the adult is worn out or dizzy, right? Or falling down, right? Or, or you can't do it anymore or you want to do something bad to the child, right? Whatever it is, again, 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 right? Dad, again, again, again. And G.K. Chesterton talks about one of the effects of, of, of the restoration of our humanity might be that just again and again and again, things that are good and true 
are equally sweet every time. They're always rich. The fall diminishes our capability to appreciate the richness of God's goodness. This side of heaven, we're praying for the Spirit of God to take us deeply into the wonder of what it means to be loved by Jesus. One day we'll be freed from the effects of the fall just to enjoy it. Enjoy it. And that's what what, uh, Paul is here, enduring and then opposition, right? So Paul wants Timothy to reflect on what he's seen, right? His Paul is a picture of a life of commitment to God. And this is what standing firm looks like, right? When you see it here, it's a life that follows Christ right and through opposition. All right, and the second thing here is what standing firm accepts. And this is something here that we just need to read and be reminded of. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Uh, I lost the place. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse. Uh, deceiving and being deceived, right? Now, the simple thing here is to stand firm in the life God has provided for us in Christ by the Spirit, we need to accept that it will cost you something in this life. It will cost you something, right? Now, this is what Jesus said. If you want to find your life, you've got to lose it. You've got to take up your cross and follow me. Right? To take up the cross is not to take up the, the, the symbol of popularity. Right? It's not to take up the symbol of applause. It's not to take the symbol of, of, of status. Right? It's to take the symbol of the outcast, the one that was rejected by the world. Right? And again, our goal is not to be rejected by the world. Our goal is to be faithful to Jesus. But if you're faithful to Jesus, you'll be treated like Jesus. You know, college student, you've got to give up the naivete that if you're faithful to Jesus, that everyone will love you. Man or woman who's working, you've got to give up the naivete that if you're faithful to Jesus, that your colleagues will always like the choices that you make. Right? When you're in your home and you're raising your kids, right, and you're longing for them to come to Christ, there's going to be a disagreement between an unsaved child and a, a, a mom or a dad who loves Jesus about what's good and right. You've got to accept that. It's going to be a difference. So the issue here is, is just, we, okay, we've got we to gotta bake that into the cake, right? And so I can't, I can't adjust my life every day to try to keep people unoffended by Jesus. What I want to do is I want to be faithful to Jesus. I can't be responsible for how they respond. I'm not beating people up with Jesus. I'm not doing any of those kind of things like that. But I'm more concerned about how I represent Jesus than about how they feel about how I represented him. Okay, that's a different thing. I want to be faithful to them. You know, in a simple way, uh, my wife and I made this decision early on that we just were not going to join in when we found, you know, husbands and wives getting together, chewing up their husbands and wives, right? Now, uh, sometimes men will get together and share stereotypes of women, right, and complain about them. And women will do that on occasion as well with men. And I, I remember... Very few conversations, because once you, you, start, uh, you stop getting involved in those kind of conversations, people don't tend to have them around you, right, after a while. But I don't want to st- uh, talk about my wife in derogatory ways. I don't want to lump her into stereotypes that are negative with regards to that. She is Rana. She is my wife. I love her. I want to speak about her ways that honor her. I want to speak about ways that, that I would be happy that if she knew I was talking about her, that she would either be embarrassed because it was good, or she would agree in a way that we, we have talked openly about, and she would say, yeah, I grant that. But I certainly wouldn't want her to feel that I'm talking about her one way uh, out there, and I'm talking to her here when I'm, I'm, I'm at home. Well, in the same way, I don't want to talk about Jesus in a way here that's very different to the way I talk about him at work. Right? And so the issue here is, is we got to accept the fact. So the lesson to be learned from Paul's life, if you follow Jesus in this life, trouble follows. Right? You're the threat to the evil one. The kingdom of hell is pressing against, trying to push back against God's purposes. 
So if you're following Jesus, the evil one is going to try to undermine your marriage. If you're following Jesus, young man, he's going to try to take you into pornography. If you're following Jesus, he's going to try to highlight every little irritation within the body of Christ so that all you can think about is how that other brother or sister irritates you instead of your mission to love them to Jesus. If you, if you expect that, it's going to happen, right? And you know that God is going to allow, right? Because he's done this and he does it over time. He's going to allow us to experience the difficulties of a fallen world because he's going to use us in our weakness to declare his power. And some of us are going to testify to the power of God from our sick beds. Some of us are going to testify to the power of God from our widowhood. Some of us are going to testify to the power of God from the difficulties of our daily life. So those are the issues here. If you're going to follow Jesus, trouble is going to follow. Evil men and women who oppose Christ and his people will be on the attack and they will be active in trying to deceive you as they themselves are being deceived, right? So the idea here is we get up today and I don't get up with a battled uh, mentality, but if you get up in a day and you're naive and think that you're just walking out into a world that's not full of perils for your walk with Christ, you're naive, Perils for your marriage, perils for your friendships, perils for your, your testimony where you are, right there, there. And what do you need to do? Not run from them. You need to run to Jesus every day, right? Run to Jesus. Run to him and hold on to him. And then finally, the issue here is this final issue. Uh, I got stuck, I think, Steve, here. Can you push me forward one more? Oh, okay. That's all right. We'll figure it out. Well, the, the final one is what, what we're to stand firm on. So read this with me. This is the most famous part of the passage. Okay. Second Timothy 3 said, uh, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here he ends by taking Timothy to the source of the truths that Paul, Timothy's mother, Timothy's grandmother, and Timothy himself have all staked their lives on, right? So what is it this, that they're holding on to? What's, it's what God has revealed about his saving work in Christ in the scriptures, right? So he reminds Timothy that God has given him everything he needs to know and find the path and stay on it, right? This tells you who you are. This tells you who God is. This tells you the way to live. It tells you what's wrong with you. It tells you how to fix it, Right? It tells you what the people in your life need. So uh, this is the issue that that Paul comes to is to Scripture. Now, this isn't an apologetics defense, which is many things we could say about, uh, for Paul, he doesn't stop and say, well, let me defend why you should trust Scripture. He doesn't stop, right? Already, Paul believes the Old Testament. He believed it as a Jew, but he believes it even more so because Christ believed it, right? Christ said it's all valid, it's all true. And what is the New Testament? As far as the apostles are concerned, you read about this in 2 Peter chapter 3, it's the words of the resurrected Christ through his authorized agents. So if we really had a New Testament truly in the way that the apostles looked at, we would kind of do away with our traditional way of highlighting the red letters of Jesus. Right? Right? what we do in the Gospels, because as far as the early church was concerned, it's all red letters. It's all red letters. It just so happens that we have a few direct quotations of Jesus, but the rest of it is still the words of Jesus through his authorized agents, right? So that's why we don't say, well, the red letters in the Gospel are super important, but the the black letters, well, they're, they're sort of important. No, no, no. It's all the Scripture, That's why when you get to the end of the book of Matthew, he says, go back and teach them everything which I taught you, which is the book of Matthew. That's laid out. So the scriptures are the foundation. And he said, it's God's word, which by the work of the spirit will teach him what he needs to know about who God is and who he is and what it means to live for God's glory, right? And if there's ever a time when you need a clear voice in your life to figure out where to go and how to think, Uh, This is a moment. 
So, and to break it down without going to all these, it's the Word of God that will rebuke him. Notice what it says about the function of the Word of God. Uh, it's God breathed, it's God's own Word through his authorized agents. To say God breathed, it's a term that Paul actually coins, and it's just, it's to, it's to, it's to visualize the process of speaking. When I say a word, I breathe it out over my vocal cords, right? So this is to say God breathes, to say it's God's own voice that's here in the scriptures, right? So God has spoken, and, and this is the character of it. And of course, if it's God's word, it partakes of the character of its author. So what do we know about the author? The author is true. He's faithful. He doesn't lie. He represents what's necessary. He's a God of love who's trying to bring us into the newness of life, right? So that's what the scriptures are. Scriptures aren't dry doctrine. They're just not some, something for a group of people to haggle about the details. No, it's, it's, it's the word of God spoken to us to enable us to come to know Christ and to live out that life for Christ. It makes us wise to salvation, right? So what does it do to make us wise? What's it do? It rebukes us. Right? And you should have the experience, it should, there's something wrong, probably with us as preachers or at EBC, if you don't come in from time to time and just feel nailed by something that God says. It's not nailed by the preacher. Preacher, if, if I'm faithful, I want to tell you what God says. And if he stands over against you and it says, boom, well, then you need to receive that because it's his mercy to say, you're, you're da David, you're walking away from me. David, you're walking down a path of death. Don't go there. And it's rebuking you for life, not just to come and hammer on you. God never comes in to quash you. He's always restraining you from sin to get you path in the right path. So if he comes and says something to you about your relationship with your husband or wife, the rebuke is for your living. But that it's not just rebuke. He just doesn't come and say, hey, that's wrong, that's sin. He comes and he wants to correct you. Well, the idea of correction is to get you back on the path of life. Right, so it's not just merely stop, stepping you, holding you back, right, as a parent, right, if you're talking to your children, it's not that your goal as a parent is to get them from, to stop from being annoying, right? What's your goal as a parent? I want them to stop being annoying. Well, that's a terrible goal, right? That's a terrible goal. It's very selfish, right, as if you're the standard of what what's, uh, uh, classifies for them to be uh, good or not annoying. But the other thing is, not, it's not positive. What is it you're trying to shape them toward? Right? And, and so as a, as a parent, I wanted, and I, I know I've told this to my girls many times, I didn't want good girls. I wanted followers of Jesus. Yes, do I want them to stay out of all kinds of stuff? Yes. I don't want them to have a killer testimony where they have to testify how God rescued them from deep darkness that's going to scar them their whole life. I don't want to do that. I want to celebrate every time God does that with everyone. We all have our own scars. But I didn't want girls that just did the right thing because they didn't want to mess up their dad's life or they just wanted to stay below the radar or they were a different person with each other or with their peers than they were with the adults. They weren't living these kind of two-faced, three-faced lives. I wanted them to love and know Jesus because I know that if it's just outside and I'm just commending Jesus and talking about Jesus and it doesn't become their Lord, they're going to walk away from him. Because when life gets difficult and they have to make hard decisions about who they're going to marry, they have to make hard decisions about their money and their life and decisions at work, they're not going to take the path of Jesus if they don't know Jesus. And so I want them to know Christ that's something more holistic than getting them to stop tearing up the furniture, right? Now, that's a part of that, big part, right? Uh, cleanliness is next to godliness, isn't that true, right? Whatever. But the issue here is, right, I, I want them to get after it. And sometimes as parents, right, the big picture of where you're taking your kids today, what is that big picture? Because what happens to us, it happened to us as parents too, the only thing that you're looking at is the immediate thing that's driving you crazy and you're not looking at the big picture, and then you're behaving as if that's the only thing that matters in your interaction with them. You're not affirming them. You're not talking to them about Jesus. You're not taking the, the conversation in a different direction altogether instead of managing the problem all the time. So the issue here is it corrects us. It takes us back somewhere. And then the consummate effect, if you'll see it here, 
is that it trains us in righteousness. I think that is the consummate effect of teaching, uh, rebuking, and correcting. It tells us who we are, who God is, what matters. It rebukes us when we get off path. It corrects us back to the path. And the consummate effect is what? It trains you to live righteously, to live in a way that reflects God's priorities. That's what it does. And as a result of that, you're ready and suited for everything that God wants you to do today, for every interaction with your kids, for every interaction with your spouse, for the interaction with your neighbors, for the way to spend your money, for making decisions as you're watching entertainment, right? It fits you out to live into the saving work that he wants you to have, right? It prepares you for that because it, it, it tools your soul. All right, let's come to the end here. So I'm going to use this image here uh, of this uh, lighthouse. I, I came across it. It's, it's something you can find easy. But the thing that struck me about it is that it's beaming out light while the, the waves are just trying to knock it right off of the rock that it's perched on. But it's not, it's not just standing there. It's, it's, it's beaming light while it's doing it, right? So it's functioning for the Lord in the face of real opposition. And it's an image that I've been thinking about this week. And so, a couple things to take away from here. One, when you, if you think that life doesn't have any sure ground, right? as we sang today, there is a place to stand. There is a place to stand, and that's important though. There is safe ground. There is reality that we can put our feet down on. Right? All the little things about every little decision, we may not know, but we do know that I'm lost, that I've run from my Creator, that God in his mercy pursued me in Christ. He did everything that I needed to, to be saved on the cross and he came out of that grave and all I have to do is abandon myself and put my trust on him. That is the solid ground that will guide me through life. That's the solid ground. So what's what we sing about? Christ is our cornerstone, right? That's the solid, there is a place to stand. And today, I wanna stand on Jesus. Stand on. Second thing, The place to stand is the truth that God has revealed about the Father's work in Christ by the Spirit, the Scriptures, right? And I say the Scriptures in that regard because the whole of the story, right? You notice when we read about the gospel in 2 Timothy 1, is it envisioned God's work before time, before He created everything, through time, right up until the end of time. So the whole story is the story about God the Father's work in the person of Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, life, death, burial, and resurrection, and his coming by the Spirit to reclaim and restore everything. That's the story. Right? So he wants us to live in that story, and that's the foundation that needs to undergird my life today. And then thirdly, there is one place to stand. Now this is the interesting thing here, is that Jesus can't be under your right foot and something else under your left foot. Right? Any of you that have ever done that on a dock with a boat? All right, have you ever seen that on a dock with a boat? Right? You got your foot on the dock and you got your other one on the boat and then you're watching you know, the splits happen, right? And that's just, it just doesn't work, right? And then you wind up what? Falling into the water, right? And so the issue here, if you've you got one foot on Jesus and that's first, right? We know, right? I know about it as a follower of Christ over time. I got my one foot in. I come to church. I got my one foot in. But I got another foot out here that when I'm living out here in the world and living around other people, I don't look very much like Jesus. I don't talk and represent Jesus very much. And matter of fact, I'm more concerned about the opinions of people than I am necessarily about what Jesus thinks about me. And so I got these two things here and I, I'm going to split and fall down. And that's the, kind of, that's the kind of thing here. There's only one place to stand and you got to put both feet in them. So I know I've mentioned this before, and I say this to you as young people. One of my favorite quotes from a a theologian was a paraphrase of Ecclesiastes 12. And it says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Well, his paraphrase was, choose sides while you're young. Choose sides. Right? Don't waver. Choose sides. Right? You can stand there and stay standing only by God's grace. Right? You can only stand today if you're leaning in on Jesus. Rhonda can only stand if she's leaning in on Jesus and looking to him and looking to God's people to help her do that. She can't do it on her own. She's not going to get enough self-help from every TV program unless she looks to him. He's the only resource who can sustain her hope and her faith and her trust to keep her loving in the face of difficulty. 
He's the only one that can do that. He's the only one that can sustain you through grief. He's the only one that can sustain you through reversal. He's the only one that can sustain you through disappointment. He's the only one that can sustain you to listen to what's true when everybody else is trying to define you by his grace. You need him to tell you who you are over and over and over again. It's been tested and tried and found to be sufficient for life by many, right? What's Paul doing here, right? Paul, your mom, and your grandma, right, draws them in. They have lived their life, and they've, they've rested on that, right? And that's where, by God's grace, right, one of the functions I want to play, hopefully in my family, and I know that each one of us do, I don't want to be, by God's grace, Someone that my family has to lean in on Christ deeply for his grace to get over my failure. Am I prone to failure? Yes. Am I weak? Yes. Am I vulnerable? Yes. Right? I know I've shared this story with you uh, many times. I can never get over it of sitting on Mount Pisgah in, in the Holy Land. It's traditionally the site where Moses went up to look into the Holy Land. And you remember, Moses didn't get to go into the Holy Land because he had been unfaithful to God in a very dramatic public way right at the end of his life. This is the man who had seen the Exodus. This is the man who had led the people out and seen the dramatic power of God. And then in a stupid, foolish moment, he asserts his own self, makes him the center of attention. And God says, Moses, you're not going to get to go in. David fell down before the finish line. Solomon fell down before the finish line. I want to go out like Caleb. I want to go out like Joshua. I want to go out like Joseph. Right? You need him, right? It's been tested and tried. His standing is active, right? There's things to do, right? And, and this is why if, if you're living a passive Christian life, if you're just... You're waiting for Sunday to do for you what you need to be doing on your knees and in your walk with the Lord on your own. It's not going to satisfy what you need. And, and if you're struggling to study, get a, get a hold of somebody. Become a part of a Bible study, right? Go somewhere where somebody is helping you to listen regularly to the Word of God, to get recalibrated, right? Don't be passive, right? You can come, you can come listen to Chris, the men. You can live to Chris on, on Wednesday nights, Right? Probably by the end of the summer, he'll be through Ephesians 1, verse 3. Right? And, and I say that because I love him, because it's so rich and good. Right? But you come away from that, and you get astounded at the glory of God and his wonder. Right? You get involved in one of the women's studies. You, some of you women, you need to come, even though it's, an, uh, it's out of your schedule, you're tired at the end of the day, but you need to come and pray with other women. You need to hear their hearts. You need to, to see that they're struggling with the same thing you are. You need God's resources to help you. You maybe need to find a friend or somebody you can be vulnerable to, to say, I, really, my Bible is dry. I really don't walk with him at all. I just kind of live off the fumes of everything. I need help, right? But if you're passive, it's not going to sustain you, right? The waves are too strong. And then it, it is a solid, as a rock solid for a life of purpose and meaning now, and it prepares you for the life to come. You notice how Paul lives his life for the future. Right? As uh, Amy Coney Barrett said, phrase here, life is short, eternity is long. Life is short, eternity is long. This is why Paul could say something that seems so astounding if you're in a time of difficulty or suffering. When Paul speaks about the present life as his light, momentary afflictions. And the reason why he says that, because in light of the glory that awaits the only way to describe the present is light momentary. So, for those of us who need to hold on in your struggle with lust, for those of you who need to hold on in your struggle with pride, with greed, with anger, selfishness, you need to hold on. He is sufficient. He's the only place to stand and help is on the way. Help is on the way. So stand firm. Stand firm. Gray and Jack, would you come lead us in song?